lived in Strathbogie for now 15 years. We live in Euroa, which is at the base of the foothills. We Strathbogie is a small shire with a population of around about 10,000 people. Euroa is a fairly small town with a population of about 2,000 people. It's, got a it's full of vibrant and interesting people who take the environment seriously, but also take their community seriously. So it's got a you know, We both feel a great sense of community spirit here. It's the people who make where you are. Makes it home. You walk down the street and everyone knows what each person's dog's called, so it's sort of the town's that, that small. Person, that person. So when you walk down the street, you can say hi to half a dozen people you, you know. It's and old, not. old country with rolling hills. and. I, I believe um, I still have my ancestors here taking care of things. I'm, I'm really connected. We love this area and we want to leave it in better shape than when we came here. So if we can do that, we'll be happy yeah, for our kids. It feels to me like this, is, this place has got, got a voice. We want a clean air, clean water, and it's beautiful sort of fresh air. So we feel it's a very it. interesting, it's beautiful very environment. Different. The creek's coming off the Strathbogie. Right. There's also been a lot of small towns, but we actually do have it's too a lot to do. I'll fight for that. My name is Kate Orty. I'm a member of the organising group of Strathbogie Voices. We've been running a series of environmental discussions all year for 2015 because we think it's the watershed year for climate change. Because we feel there's this momentum building with real uh, concern and need for action on climate change, uh, we as a group I guess thought that let's have these conversations and let's participate in them. Uh, and really fortunate enough we've just got these fantastic speakers on board to help us, to guide us in these conversations. Our community is a strong community but they feel they don't have the answers to a lot of the questions and it's great to bring in some of the big name speakers because they can give some of the answers and this is really empowering. Sometimes we hold back on these things living in a regional or rural area because we're just unsure about how other people feel. So having this opportunity is quite cathartic for us, I think, to just to be able to do it. We're saying to people, we can do better because we learn from each other. And that's very clearly been one of the significant outcomes from our environment series. It creates a unification and a bit of empowerment for people to um, think that they can do something whether it's locally or globally, you know, we can do something. And that's what Strathbogie Voices is. It's been inspiring, inspiring to see um, the level of commitment by this community to come on a, on a Saturday to give up their time um, and have not said, um, well, we're too small to matter, but they've actually boxed uh, above their weight. And we're, we're famous for that. Australians. And there's a certain freedom to speak out uh, from, from, from the heart and from you know, what, you, what you really want to say. So I guess what you get is a real um, genuine discussion where people speak their minds. Strathbogie Voices at least is an option for the, the man in the street, the woman in the street, to actually sit down with kindred spirits and try and work out a future. It's, it's not like you go to a meeting and you feel as though well, we've all talked about it and we all feel awfully good about it, but now we know nothing will happen. One feels that here there is some drivers that will actually take this and continue the conversations on. And I think it's terribly important that we do. It's really impressive to see so many people from a rural area getting involved in, in an issue like this, especially as, it's, as they tend to be the communities that are kind of affected first. There's a big issue, but things can be done. And there are other people out there that that feel the same way and that's what Strathbogie Voices is all about. We need to believe in ourselves about this town, about this shire. Here's a group who would probably love to do all of these energy things but can't. How would you model to place them? People initially said, oh, aren't we getting great speakers from Melbourne? And as the series developed, people kept saying, we're getting good speakers from Melbourne, but aren't we making a contribution to this discussion? And people started to realise that they had a great deal to celebrate themselves. You always have to celebrate people coming together, no matter what, because ultimately the connections are what's making, making a difference. 
We should be celebrating what we're achieving and we should continue to push for change. You never know what happens from a meeting like this. It's immeasurable because people go away thinking about this stuff and they'll inject something somewhere else and so that's how this connectivity works. Yeah, I think it's awesome. <laughs>Climate change is an ethical and moral issue. If we don't have a healthy environment, then um, we don't have um, the possibility of a healthy civilization. We can't afford to put more pressure on our kids. It's our job now. It's about moving public opinion away from fossil fuels and creating the space for legislation that's in line with the climate science. We have no choice but to decarbonize our energy system. We do still have choices. It is not too late. A lot of people would like it if someone else fixed the problem. It's up to the government or it's up to other countries or Australia's role is small or it's not really our fault. For too long I think we've been saying, you know, if that country doesn't lead, we won't lead either. But I think it's beyond the conversation now. I mean, it's no longer something that you either believe in or not, it is there and we have to find a solution to it. It was clear that some people came along to the meetings thinking that this should be something that the government should do. It should be a government by regulation to deal with these really significant issues. We agree with that, I think all of us agree with that, but we all knew that if the government's not doing something, we needed to be making our contribution and making our views known. In a way, the fact that there's been very little leadership from our politicians, we have sort of said, well, look, we're going to just go ahead and do it anyway. So in a way, Tony Abbott has been an enormous contributor to the rise of um, empowering the people because he was so useless. We have a responsibility to start pushing harder. And maybe that wouldn't have happened if we'd had better leadership. We wanted to show when we started this series that local people could have an impact on how their immediate representatives were dealing with these issues, so that's at the local level. I think the reason people turn to local action is that they don't get any answers when they uh, turn to national government. They feel powerless when they look at things happening internationally and they start realising that there's a local dimension, that councils can be advocates and voices for them. How do we close the gap of communication between the various parties? Because we want to be a resource to our council. Councils are key environmental players and um, uh, I think often communities aren't aware of that and I suppose one of the things I think is important is to build up community awareness of the role that councils are playing and the roles they can play and if uh, you don't mind the way they should play. The first step might be building a, a strong local and regional action but then engaging with a much, much wider community. We wanted to show that the sorts of things that we thought were important would play out in a state arena as well. And we wanted to make sure that the things that we did also were picked up by the departments that develop government policy and operate it once it's been instilled. Governments change and policies change. So I've, as a public servant, I've been um, uh, advising state governments where they've been very active in, um, in the renewable energy space and at, at times the federal um, government hasn't been as, uh, as interested um, but that's not stopped uh, state governments from, from acting. There are many things that are happening at the local level that are demonstrating that local action is needed even more to put pressure on the federal government, but also to demonstrate that many things are possible. A week doesn't go by that um, my office isn't contacted where there's a community somewhere that wants to access information. Uh, governments come and go. I guess what's important is uh, a strong leadership from, from government, um, whether it's local, state or federal, and consistency. And hopefully we can see that uh, going into the future. Actually, there are opportunities 
to transform Australian society in a way that addresses climate change and also produces a healthier society which is much more community involved and transitions the Australian society from a 20th century or early 21st century society to a more community oriented, more sustainable and healthier society which is resilient and sustainable for a longer period of time. So, you know, there are good things that sometimes come out of challenges. I think that many people who are part of our conversation are just doers. They come from all sorts of walks of life, they're humble people, but they take their contribution very seriously. I'm Grant Tarrish from Algo Wines. Um, Algo is a, is a mixed farm and it's, we, we run sheep, crop and vineyard and have a winery all in one, so it's quite a diverse business. Um, the wind turbine supplies 200% of our energy requirements. And we, we did that um, purely because it's such a, a good wind site and we saw the opportunity to, to do something sustainable but also that would pay its way. They've been people who've been doing extraordinary things They've been doing little things, but they've been doing what they can and they've been taking the view that it's not always about the environment. Sometimes it's about the co-benefit. Sometimes it's about how your economics are improved by adopting an environmental solution. A lot of bigger businesses would be able to do it quite easily. It's just, um, they're just not trying. And um, it, it does make sense financially and it's, yeah, it's not actually that hard, but um, yeah, it's just a shame it's not more common. Our green electrician in this region, Jack Smythe, for instance, he got his green electrician skills as a result of his community saying they felt there was a need for that skills base to be housed in the community. My name's Jack Smythe. I started an electrical business about eight years ago um, in Yarrawa. We wanted to try something different, um, as in sort of grow the business or look for sort of a niche market. So we went and did a course in, in solar, Grid Connect, and um, so the business grew fa fairly rapidly from there. What's happened as a result of Jack acquiring that ability is he's brought on board a range of young men to work in his, in his business. So our company grew from two people up to about 14. Um, and whenever our company has actually grown, it's always been around renewable energy, which has been, which has been great for us because that's where we sort of want to stay. Throughout country Victoria, we've completed about 4,000 installs. So yeah, we're quite proud of that. We've also got in our community people who are builders who've come along who you would expect to be knocking up a house and moving on. That's not been the case. My name's Guy Morford. I'm from Harper and Morford Builders in Yarrawa. We're very passionate about sustainable building and sustainable building practices. You know, it's something we want to educate people with as much as we can when they're coming through the doors and looking at buildings. We've had builders who are part of the next wave of thinking about how they're going to build for the future. And, and it really is simple, uh, sustainable building practice, but I think it's just that little bit of smarter planning at the start that can save the, the consumer a lot in the long run. It's been deeply nuanced. We have this view that farmers aren't intellectuals. Well, in my experience, farmers have been doing a lot of really purposeful thinking about what they want to see happen. My name's Charlie Bryden. I'm a local Yarrawa farmer. I'm very passionate about um, land conservation and appropriate utilisation of our shrinking resources and we tried to set up our farming practices on a fairly user-friendly basis so that we're not sort of 
pushing the land too hard, but we were allowing the land to work out its own balance. I'm Kath Marriott and I'm a farmer. We've been farming in Gamalaby for about 30 years and we ended up in a situation in 2003 where we had seven and a half inches of rain um, out of a normal 25 inch winter rainfall and we needed to think of a way that we could manage the farm without uh, diminishing the, the, uh, the ground cover um, of the grasses and we had four and a half thousand sheep at that stage and we sold them down to 800 and we started a lamb finishing business and contained the sheep so that they weren't destroying the country with just just too many of them. We all want our farms to rem remain viable if they can, so we've got to adapt because the climate's not going to adapt for us. We've got to adapt to it. With the numbers of people that are going to be displaced by climate change, I could say that it will probably be an indulgence to think that we would still have the farm as it is today. You'll get some people who are entrenched and still doing it the way they did it 45 years ago, but I think they're in the minority. The majority of people that I talk to are accepting that the climate has changed and is still changing and that their practices have got to change. the people that we've had interviewed for this series is Rochelle Patton. We know that unless we're talking to Indigenous people in our country, we have missed a very significant contribution and we know that we need to recognise Aboriginal people as the First Nations of this country. And we haven't always done that and when we haven't done it, our discussions are poorer for the loss. Um, first, I'm Yorta Yorta, my um, name is Rochelle Patton. My family come from Yorta Yorta. When I asked her to come on board with the climate change group, the Yorta Yorta climate change group, she was the first person to agree to have that conversation. Well, I'm a bit worried about, you know, things happening in the river and um, what people are doing to, to our country. My mother would be disgusted to see the river the way it is now. Um, you know, sometimes it's really painful even. When I was little, it was clear. And, and of course, we all lived on the riverbanks. Because we weren't allowed to live in town, so. When she moved along the river with her mother and her siblings, they always moved in the Murray system. She was a person who slept under bridges in the Murray system. She knows that river and she's watched it over the years that she's grown, grown to wisdom. Everything told us about what was going to happen and what was ready, what you know, to eat and and stuff like that. Just um, the bush told us, animals told us. You know, we can do better. Uh, if everyone tried, it'd be better, better place. Not just here, but everywhere. You know, we're all working together and respect each other and uh, respect where we live. The thing that I think is important about the way nature's played out in this conversation for all of us is how many people have brought a different understanding of what nature is to them to the discussion. So a farmer would have a different understanding to a person who's living in town and worried about the future for their children who are currently in kindergarten. That connection with, with the natural world is one of the many things that keeps me positive about anything. Every week or two I'm up here to walk and it's probably 35 minutes away from my home to come up here but it's the place that resets me into, into who I am in the midst of it, you know, into, in a very deep spiritual sense, you know, to, um, to come back here is very, very important to me. I've got a rainforest growing at home on my hot little hill from northern New South Wales. It's growing very, very strongly and very well. And, and I can sit in there and feel so spiritually rewarded from the energy of all of these trees and living things around me. It's absolutely beautiful. 
We forget spirit too. It's all here. And a lot of people don't see it, even my mob. But uh, I work really hard to to get it, and, and I have. I can do things in a spiritual way. I can bring birds, I can send them away. I can do that sort of thing. You know, I'm going to have a conversation with this place, you know, with the rocks, with the moss, with the lichens, with the trees, with the air and the birds around me, you know. That's important. I think that's, that's beginning to have a more than sustainable relationship with place. That's connection with respect. If people do not understand the natural systems that sustain life on Earth, uh, that you know are important in, in the whole discussion of climate change, they're not going to to look after it. And, and children nowadays, they, they probably have the least time and space in nature of any generation ever before in the world. And um, if their parents don't know how to connect with nature, the children don't learn how, how to either. I'm Katie Long, and I'm a kindergarten teacher here at Euroa Kindergarten. So I grew up on a farm, and it was an environment that we explored. and really grew in terms of our confidence and um, skills so I would like I would really like to be able to instill that same sort of sense of awe and interest um, with the children that I teach. This comes out time and time again if children have spent time in nature and they get to understand you know what nature is they tend to look want to look after it when they grow up as adults. We're hoping to instill some of that in the children that we're teaching now. And even though our children are young, they're four and five years old, this is where the seed is planted. And so when they revisit sustainable practices when they go on to primary school and secondary school, they can just build on the information and knowledge that they've already got. Um, and hopefully they'll be more sustainable in their practices. I have a feeling that the earth is not here for me. It's actually here to be part of this living, robust ecosystem with lots of diverse insects, animals, the whole thing, plants. And, and I talk to the plants and I talk to the animals. <laughs> and occasionally I talk to my children too. It's not enough just to save our country. It's not enough. What we need to do is actually start the, the conversation again, you know, to actually immerse ourselves more and more in country, spend more and more time on country and feel it, you know. It's like, it feels to me like this, is, this place has got, got a voice and we're just not listening, you know. This is our country and, uh, and we all need to pull together. We live in a beautiful part of the world, so I don't think, yeah, no, I don't think you have to be a greenie. I just think it's more about um, education, really. We all know that we can do better, and we all want to do better. We feel that that's our role, and that it's not really that hard. I think everything I've done, I'm not trying to change the world. I, I just, like I said earlier, I, I love where I live and I, I just want to, after I've spent my life here, leave it a little bit better than when I got here for my kids. Our youngest son, his ambition is to take over the farm and he said to me when he was only about five, when I own this farm, I'm going to have more cattle than you have, Dad. So we've got to look after it for him. In our trade, everyone always, um, this discussion comes across in relation to the bottom line and how they can save money. Um, we, we won't be able to eat money if uh, you know, things go down. I mean, obviously we'd love to see Yeroa grow, but I think we'd like to see Yeroa grow uh, in the right fashion. I think that if everybody plays a part, um, 
then it contributes to a greater picture. If everybody just sort of said, oh, it's all too hard, and we, you know, then nothing would get done. And I think it's easy to put your head in the sand and think that it's not going to worry you. But it's the individual saying, well, I'm not waiting for someone else to do it. I'm going to do whatever I, I can. It sounds like a cliche, but the change does start with you. If we all change, then it could only get better. You know, things will come back. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're a child or an adult, or if you've been working on this thing for 30 years, or maybe you're just new. Everybody has to contribute something to this discussion. Uh, everybody has life experiences that are relevant. And by bringing people together, you get an exchange of information and ideas, and, and it's like a catalyst, like a spark. And that's what you need, you know, you need you need events like this to make that happen. I think that the Aurora Environment Series through Strathbogie Voices has changed the way we talk about environment and made it possible for people to have that conversation. All of a sudden it's become kind of every day to just discuss this stuff and expect others to join in the conversation. So we're really happy. When we started the series, we were talking about taking a film to Paris and it was a little bit of a joke. Can we get the regional Australian sort of voice heard at that level. I think we really will take a film to Paris. We're on the road to Paris and this is a watershed year and you've come along to say that you think that's the case too. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here and supporting what we thought was important. Thank you to all of you. The Paris talks for, for us have been a galvanising um, event but I think that for Paris itself, it's good to know that there are people all over the world taking these matters seriously. We are so firmly immersed in the conversation now that Paris is almost a suburb of our town.